Hi, Boilermaker families, and thanks for joining us for another parent and family virtual event. Uh, this time we are focusing on summer and getting ready to think about options that are available at Purdue over the summer. We know we have spring break coming up, and certainly we hope this is a good time to be thinking about summer plans, summer weather, and opportunities here at Purdue this summer. My name is Kelly Steer, and I get to serve as the Director of External Relations here at Purdue, and one of the ways that I get to um, work at Purdue is with parents and families. So we're really glad to have you watching and thinking about what summer options are available for your students here at Purdue. I do have two great colleagues joining me tonight from our summer sessions office and from university residences. If your student is thinking about being here over the summer and also wanting to live here on campus. Also, our session uh, this time will focus mostly on our current students. We know that there may be families of incoming students who are watching and have interest in summer sessions. This will hopefully give you a good overview if your student is choosing Purdue or does choose Purdue and what summer could look like in the future for them. We will have a couple of pieces of information on programs for uh, incoming students who might want to start in the summer as well, and also more contact information for you if you are interested in that way too. One of the other things that we do with these virtual events is we also focus our virtual events on uh, one or more of the pillars of Steps to Leaps at Purdue. And this pillar tonight that we're really going to focus on that will be woven throughout the session is networks. As you can imagine, students who are here over the summer have an opportunity to have an experience that's a little bit different outside of the normal fall and spring academic year. And their network on campus can certainly expand. It can look different. They can meet different friends, different students, faculty, staff, and be involved in many different things over the summer that can help expand their networks and their opportunities as they are uh, going through their journey here at Purdue. So tonight we're going to go ahead and uh, jump in with the information that will be helpful to you um, as you think about summer for your students and talk with them and pass on this information to them as well. I'm going to welcome Sean Defoe, who works with our summer sessions program, and he's going to give you a great overview of the different options that are available for students this summer. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. And thank you, Kelly, for allowing us to be here to talk about uh, summer at Purdue. It's a great time. Uh, so uh, you see here with our first slide, summer at Purdue. Uh, this is a shot of some students from a couple years ago um, during uh, COVID, but even then you can see they're having a lot of fun um, with what was being offered. On the next slide, please. So uh, registration for summer uh, kind of takes place over a series of different weeks. Um, begins with our senior students, uh, then it uh, uh, then it's to our juniors, uh, followed by sophomores, and then our current students. Um, so everybody gets a chance to register for summer classes, and then on the 28th of February, it opened up for all students. So currently, right now, uh, all students can register for summer classes, uh, whether that be uh, students looking to um, start in the summers. And again, summer is a great time to uh, start at Purdue. Uh, and students can register up until when, you know, a course starts. So they still have a lot of time before summer will kick off, which will start on our first module on May 16th this summer. Next slide. Uh, so for courses, we do have a number of course options for students, uh, more than 700 unique courses. And as you can see, we do offer quite a number of online courses. We know that's really important to students in terms of being able to have the flexibility of going and doing an internship or a summer job. So there are a number of online course options that are available. Um, and it depends a little bit between a course being offered uh, synchronously, which would sort of mean that you have to log in at a certain day at a certain time to sort of view the lecture material or asynchronously where a student could log into a class, watch a pre-recorded lecture, and then do some of their um, uh, assignments as needed. Um, I posted the link there too um, for people to be able to go to and check out all the options that we have and um, we'll show you here in a little bit some of the different uh, breakdowns of some of the weeks of some of the classes that we have. So, But summer is a great time for all majors, for all programs uh, at Purdue. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so this one here kind of shows you and breaks it down the various different lengths of courses. So there are four week uh, class offerings, six week class offering, eight weeks, and then 12 weeks long, which would be the whole entire summer. Um, you can mix and match any kind of combination of courses that will fit best into your plans. That's kind of the nice thing about being able to make it so customizable and do something in May, maybe have June off and then come back in July and work on a course and finish it in August and have a couple weeks off before the fall semester would begin. So it's really nice that way. Uh, next slide. Um, and here's just, you see kind of some common examples of different lengths or combination of courses that students may do. Um, you see on the right side there, uh, the summer 22 is May 16th through August 5th. Then there's sort of the uh, information listed underneath there is kind of the breakdown of the different four-week modules when they start. So May 16th, June 13th, and then July 11th. Um, and then sort of the six-week length of modules and then the eight-week eight length of modules. Uh, the nice thing, too, about summer, especially as you see there, if you take six credit hours, you might as well take nine credit hours because just it's just a flat rate across the board that students would have to pay. So it's really kind of a nice way to maximize what summer can do for you in terms of being very fiscally responsible and uh, knowing what uh, it will cost and everything like that. And I'll have a slide here in a little bit that will show a little bit more of that breakdown and why summer can be so um, advantageous for people. Next slide. Uh, so this is that summer. So summer tuition actually equals a lot of savings. Um, on the left, you see kind of the breakdown of what it is for an in-state student, so an Indiana resident, an out-of-state student, and an international student. Um, Try to break it down in one to five credit hours or more than nine credit hours. You see the, uh, it would be the cost per credit hour that students would pay for each course there. And you see the breakdown of in-state, out-of-state, international. Six to nine credit hours, again, if you're an out-of-state student, you would pay just under $7,200 for six credit hours as well as nine credit hours. So that's a great way for you to really get a lot of bang for your buck. Um, and then on the far right there, you see what a fall or spring semester would cost you in terms of uh, taking eight or more credit hours in a semester. So um, divide that out. You can see it's actually pretty economical for students to utilize summer to um, speed their time to degree, get to whatever it is they need to do to work that full-time job, um, and then also uh, save on tuition in the long run. So Purdue is really doing a great job about looking out for families and keeping their uh, students in mind by doing that. So next slide. Um, here's just a couple of examples of scholarship programs that we have in the area that I work in. So our Summer Stay Scholars is an opportunity for students to uh, look at some different research or internship opportunities that um, are across campus. It's not an exhaustive list of all the different opportunities that are out there, um, but it is a good number of listings across several different departments or units. Um, and students can be whatever major and apply to these different experiences. It's not major specific. Uh, summer Internship Plus, this is a great one for students that uh, got that internship somewhere and still want to be able to do some classes so they can apply and if selected get up to $1,000 towards uh, their tuition in the summer. Summer Finish, this is one is really great for those seniors that instead of delaying their um, graduation a uh, whole entire semester, why not look to finish up in summer and be able to get a scholarship to help fund the cost of being able to do that. So. Uh, the advisor initiated scholarships. So we have uh, quite a number of professional advisors on campus and each of them can nominate a student to receive up to $500, um, which is a great thing because um, we know our advisors know their students the best and know which ones could really utilize some extra scholarship funds to help fund their education in the summer. And then uh, if we did have anybody who might be homeless, um, we do actually have a housing scholarship that we offer um, to help cover the cost for those students as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so this slide here just kind of gives sort of an example of uh, need-based summer aid at Purdue. So um, really importantly, and we always strongly encourage all of our students to apply for uh, summer aid through their My Purdue portal. Um, and we have some examples here. We've worked with our colleagues at the Division of Financial Aid to put this uh, information together. Um, and as you can see, uh, if a student was to take a four credit hour course and their family had a zero EFC, and that stands for Expected Family Contribution, um, 
through other aid, the student would be only looking at having about $400, $400 due to them to Purdue. So something like that uh, advisor initiated scholarship that I talked about um, a little bit ago, that would be a great scholarship for a student to be nominated for because then it would help to basically cover all their costs that they would have. Um, we see again here with the student that has a three credit hours uh, and their family would have a expected family income or contribution, excuse me, of just over $7,100. To Purdue, they would only be due $550 for the summer. And then again, kind of getting to that six to nine credit hour, um, that's sort of, again, that most bang for your buck. Um, if a family has a zero EFC, a student may actually be looking at a over a $1,500 refund to themselves. And then if a, uh, if a student has a family, uh, expected family contribution of over $9,000, they may be looking at $550 refund. So um, it's, and it's best to do that because uh, at Purdue, like if this is their uh, main institution, um, they could actually get financial aid from versus if they were to look to go to some other institution where maybe on the surface it seems like it would be cheaper, but actually with what we are able to show here, um, the students can be able to actually maximize their aid potential by being able to take classes at Purdue at the in the summer. So next slide. Um, and here's the best thing, uh, folks. Here's the return on investment. So uh, students that graduate in three and a half years, uh, their average starting salary is over $23,000. That's pretty impressive. Um, and then an even more fantastic thing from there, students that graduate, sorry, I meant to say three and a half years, students who graduate in three years, um, they're looking at over $54,000 worth of uh, average starting salary that they're able to get back. That's pretty fabulous. And that actually is up about $2,000 since the last time we had that number calculated. Um, so that's a really even more impressive return on investment. Um, and so for students to be able to do that, they have to take three summers at at least nine credit hours um, to be able to do that. And by doing so, that would be 27 credit hours um, and that would knock off virtually a whole entire academic year for students. So that's a great way, as, as I showed earlier, that summer is a great way to save. Next slide. Uh, so for some of you uh, families out there, if you have any new students who are looking to join us this fall, um, we actually have a program called Early Start, which would be a five-week program that would begin on the third module. So students would, um, uh, if they do the residential component of this program, uh, would move in on Friday, July the 8th. We have an orientation program uh, for them to kind of help them get orientated to campus. Uh, we have current Purdue students that serve as our peer mentors for this program. So that's a fantastic opportunity for your student to have somebody who's already been here, uh, is very familiar with the campus, can talk about the academic rigor, how to study, how to get prepared, because um, there is a little bit of a transition as you go from high school level work to college level work. And Purdue has a very high rigor in its academic courses across all majors. So it's just great to have somebody there that you feel is in your corner that is going to be able to support you. Um, with this program, particularly if you do our uh, residential option, you can take anywhere from seven to nine credit hours. Um, there is also an online option for this course as well over the five week program um, that students would take classes. But in actuality, if your student wanted to take a course in May or June, some of our other uh, times when classes start, um, they would be able to do that also. Um, and they would be able to work with their academic advisor to identify what courses they would need for their plan of study um, and be able to help, again, speed that time to degree. All right, next slide. Well, um, that wraps me up, folks. So if you have any questions, uh, here's my email address, uh, my direct line, and then again, um, purdue.edu. Thanks, Summer. Thanks again so much, and uh, thanks, Summer, and Boiler Up. Uh, well, next, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Mike Shettle, who works over in University Residences. Take it away, Mike. Thanks a lot, Sean. Uh, and, uh, and I know that there's a lot of information about summer, and I'm going to try to uh, condense the housing portion of that into, into kind of some manageable bites, but, uh, but it, it is a lot of pieces. So so let me run through what we have to offer for summer school housing and other other summer things going on you know people may think that uh, that the university slows down in the summer but actually kind of speeds up because there's a lot of action going on here in the summertime uh, next slide so summer school housing um, so if you're here as a student taking classes um, we have housing options on campus and uh, and 
over the years, the number of uh, students taking advantage of summer school housing on campus continues to grow. It, it grows at about a 10% rate a year. So we're up, uh, up anticipating about 1,300 summer school students this year. And like I said, there's other things going on on campus. Um, for the last couple of summers, conferences have been essentially uh, canceled, but this summer, conferences are back on. We have 94 conferences at this point on the books, and that will probably be about 9,000 conference guests. Uh, so, so summer school students aren't going to be the only people living in university residence. I guess that's, that's my message uh, there, but, but, uh, but there will be housing for, available for those that want to live on campus. Again, not required to live on campus, but if you want to, we have the option. Um, we, we are going to use seven different residence halls for summer school this year, and I've listed them here on the second bullet. Earhart Hall, Shreve, Harrison, Hillenbrand, Honors, Meredith South, and Parker. So these are all uh, air-conditioned buildings. They're all, uh, all the rooms for summer school are doubles with air conditioning or doubles with shared bath and air conditioning. Um, Hill and Brand and Parker are the places where they have the doubles or shared bath. We, uh, we just don't have the luxury of offering singles uh, for summer housing unless there's a medical need for it, and that has to be uh, vetted through the Disability Resource Center. So, and we also have meal plan uh, for, for our summer students, just one meal plan. It's the 13 meal plan, uh, which includes 25 dining dollars per week. And uh, we will have two um, dining courts open through the course of the summer. And, uh, and probably at times uh, others if the conference load requires it, but there'll be at least two open during the summer. Next. All right, this is a busy slide, I know. A lot of data on here. Uh, but this kind of tells you on the first column on the left what the different summer sessions are for housing. Uh, these line up for the most part with the academic summer sessions. There are a couple of additional ones on here, as you can see, A and B, the first, the first two, two uh, rows there, the one week and two week sessions. Those are kind of specialty programs uh, for uh, things like uh, students that are here for a short uh, program and then going on a study abroad or, or athletes still in competition through the spring. But, but the main academic uh, sessions are, are those uh, starting with C, C through H, and, uh, and the dates are listed there for, for when those uh, sessions are, in, are uh, scheduled and the rates for a double or a double with a shared bath in the, in the uh, fourth and fifth columns, or I guess that's the third and fourth column. Uh, you get $25 per week, and that all comes up front. So if you registered for a four-week session, uh, you get a hundred dining dollars all all up front. It's not it's not doled out by the week, um, and then the move in dates and the checkout dates are listed for each station. Move in is the uh, the Sunday prior to the first day of class. So uh, so the the May sixteenth session has move in day of May fifteenth. Uh, I know there's, there's a lot on here, but uh, this kind of summarizes our, our whole housing program for the summer, uh, for summer school. Next. And, uh, and Sean did touch on, on some uh, freshman uh, programs, so first year students, if, uh, if you are here interested uh, in information about them, I'll just touch on this real briefly, but we do have a special session for that five week program, uh, Summer Start, Emerging Leaders, and uh, and it, it runs. It's the same basic meal plan, same room types, and and uh, and the same prorated cost. Next, and early start uh, again is a, a program for those first year students that are coming in here to get an early jump. They are housed in in those same residence halls that uh, that I listed before with summer school. Next. All right, just a little bit of the process for contracting and assignments for summer. I've listed in the first bullet the, uh, the website that uh, is uh, the contracting portal. That portal has been open since February 1st. It'll stay open uh, through the beginning, at least, of, of those last uh, sessions in mid-July. Um, we will uh, try to assign, if you're here for the summer, 
try to assign you as close as we can to your fall assignment. Granted, not everybody's going to be able to get in the same building as their fall assignment, but we'll get our, our uh, I'll get you as close as we can um, if you have a fall assignment. And, and if possible, we'll get you together with your preferred roommates. And, uh, and again, because of the, so many variations and so many overlapping in different sessions, some of these things aren't always possible. But we do essentially hand assign most of summer just to, to get the, the best assignment options together as we can. We, we are starting actually this week making housing assignments. There's been a couple of hundred people already completed their housing contract for summer. Uh, but we won't be sending the assignments out until the first week of May. And then uh, obviously uh, more people may apply after that first week of May. So we'll continue to send assignments out as possible for those later uh, sessions and, and in hopes of having them all done by mid-June for those July and, and later sessions. Also, I, I understand that sometimes plans change and you think you're going to be here for summer, but something else comes up and you and you need to cancel. So in that case, you can go back to the portal. Remember, it, it's not going to close until July, but you can go back to the portal until May 5th and cancel your housing. Uh, after May 5th, though, we'll turn off the, uh, the, the cancellation feature in the portal and we'll ask you to contact our office directly. And I've, I've listed the email you are summer housing at purdue.edu and that that'll get you right into the uh, main office at university residence and uh, because we at that point we'll have already done assignments and we'll we want to know uh, as soon as possible if you need to cancel next slide all right just a couple more words about move in and move out um, sunday prior to the session starting the academic session that is that's our move-in day meal plans all begin on monday morning and then the move out is on that Saturday, uh, <clears throat> Saturday after the last session, uh, Saturday morning by noon. Now, uh, there is you know a little bit of uh, transition period between the end of the academic session and uh, the spring academic uh, semester and the beginning of summer, and so a lot of students would choose to. To go home, go on vacation, you know, go camping in the mountains, do something else for that week, and and that's fine. And then come back when it's time to move into their summer housing. It's going to be a different spot anyway, so you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to stay in your spring location through the summer just because we we reconfigure and use housing for a lot of different purposes in the summer. But if you don't want to leave for that week, we will uh, make arrangements for you to stay. There will be a daily charge for, for housing during that time. And likewise, on the end of the summer, uh, after the last summer session ends prior to the beginning of the fall contract, we can, uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna kick you out for, for that 10 day period. But if you wanna leave, you're more than welcome to leave and then come back. Um, next slide, please. All right, that kind of wraps it up for me. Uh, real quick about housing and for the summer, lots of options. And, and I know lots of questions probably come up because of that. Uh, we, so if you have some specific questions about your unique situation, here's some contact information, our uh, website for housing, also that you are summer housing address, and then uh, the phone number and the contracting portal address. So thank you. I think uh, Kelly is back to you. Thank you, Mike and Sean, for sharing uh, lots of great information. There's certainly so many opportunities uh, within summer and ways in which students can make some additional progress towards their degree um, while having a great experience here on campus over the summer, too. So now we're going to transition into questions that were submitted by families uh, that have some questions really specific to summer. So I'm going to start with Sean. Um, and bring you back in and ask a couple of questions that were submitted to us. So Sean, the first question that we have um, is, could you tell us and clarify if summer sessions are open to all students or is it restricted at all to students in any certain majors or anything like that? And Sean, we, are, we can't hear you. You'll have to bring yourself off mute. Oh, sorry there. So excited. Um, 
No, summer is open to all students. Um, and uh, in the past, I've worked with uh, like guest students from other universities that will be around in the summer or are from the West Lafayette, uh, Lafayette area and are looking to take uh, summer courses here. So um, that's something that they can do. Um, we actually also have in our area uh, high school experiences as well, too. So I just want to highlight those. So anybody who's in that uh, you know, sophomore, um, junior, senior area. We have uh, different uh, programs for those high school students to get experience here at Purdue and kind of get a taste of what it's like in the academic rigor. So, um, but no, summer is uh, open to all students um, and we welcome that. And we think it's a great opportunity to get experience here and um, kind of learn what it's like uh, at, to be a student at Purdue. Thanks, Sean. That's helpful to know as uh, families are thinking about options for their students. The next question uh, is about um, in-person versus virtual courses. And I know you touched on this a bit in your presentation, but I think it's definitely worth um, expanding on a little bit. Certainly a, a question that's come up more over the past couple of years. Uh, so how, how will students um, know if the courses that are being offered are in-person or virtual? And do they have a choice for every course one way or the other? How does that work related to summer? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, there certainly are a number of courses that are offered uh, in the virtual format over summer. Um, I wish I could say that every course is offered that way, but um, that's not the case. Um, and students would be able to see that when they would go into their My Purdue portal and their scheduling assistance, and they would be able to uh, register for courses. Um, they would be able to see kind of what's offered. Um, students can also look in the course catalog um, to see sort of what is available in person. Uh, and again, sort of look at the um, the time frame. Is it a module one course, which would begin in May? Is it a module two course, which may begins in June? Or a module three course that would be in um, July? Um, it can be a little confusing too, because we have sort of like a, a module one, two, which would mean a course that spans from the first module into the second module, module two, three. So of course that would begin in June and then we go all the way through August. Um, so it's kind of some like university uh, terms and vernacular there. Um, but uh, students would be able to see and then kind of make plans in terms of uh, which courses would sort of fit best into their plan. So, uh, the nice thing is that all students have an academic advisor here at the university, and that's somebody that uh, students can meet with. Um, they meet with at least a minimum of once a semester to kind of plan out classes for the next term. Um, and it's nice when they are when they do that in the spring semester because then they can be thinking about courses they take in the summer, and then in turn how that may uh, help to lighten their load or um, open up some different options for them in the fall term, as an example. Thank you. And, you know, I think in this next question, some families and students have already been doing their research and, and looking at the courses that are available and maybe what fits into their plan of study. Um, and there are some questions about courses that say they are worth variable credit. Would you be able to explain what that means when a student or a family sees that notation on a course? Yeah, um, I think the easiest way to sort of explain it is just in the kind of the difference in the amount of workload that you may do. Um, so for a, a lower or a smaller number of credit hours, it'll be a certain amount of workload that a student would do in a course versus, you know, in a higher uh, credit number. So something that's maybe four or five credit hours is going to be a little bit more workload that would be required uh, for them to be able to um, earn that many credit hours in that specific course for the duration. Okay, great. That makes sense. Uh, and the next question is um, really about if there are any limits to the number of courses a student can take over the summer. Are there any sort of caps or limits on what those max credit hours could be? And maybe also from your perspective, how would you advise a student to kind of determine what they think they might be able to handle over the summer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, the max that's set for a student to be able to register on their own is nine credit hours. Um, but if a student works with their academic advisor, then they can increase that up to virtually sort of any number that of uh, credit hours a student would want to take in the summer. Um, so they could get it up to 12, 15, 
even 22 credit hours if that was something they were interested in. Um, uh, Kelly brings up a good point about sort of considering summer. So depending on the length of your course, so if it's a four week course, it's gonna move pretty fast. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of work that you may be doing um, in that course. And especially if you're uh, combining it with another course at the same time, um, you wanna think about like, are you working a summer job? Um, so it's it's kind of nice to think about the difference of a course that is, as I mentioned earlier, synchronous, which uh, you may have to log in at a certain day at a certain time to watch like that lecture of the course versus an asynchronous class that, you know, you could work your job or internship during the day. And then in the evening hours, you could log in, watch the pre-recorded lecture and do your work as you would uh, for any normal in-person class that you would take. Um, but a good person to kind of have that conversation with would definitely be your academic advisor because um, they're going to kind of be the person that's going to maybe offer up some good open-ended questions for some things for you to think about and reflect on. Because um, where, as I said earlier, six to nine credit hours, that's sort of that sweet spot in terms of the cost being the same. Um, if you get above nine credit hours, then you would pay at that per credit hour rate. So just things to think about in terms of your summer plans. Um, also, it is nice to have some fun and enjoy the summer. Um, get out there maybe for a family vacation or enjoy some of the sunshine that we will have here. Um, so just a lot of good things to think about, but definitely talk it over with your academic advisor because they're going to give you some good guidance and some good um, advice. Thanks. And I think you make a great point too about thinking about ways in which students can work some sort of break into their summer. Um, certain students have certainly worked hard these past couple semesters and having that break is important. Um, do you have a question about scholarships? I know that you mentioned it uh, on your slides earlier, but there is a specific question about if scholarships are only available to current Purdue students or if they might also be available to transfer students. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, a lot of our scholarships that I mentioned are available for uh, currently registered students. So um, a lot of our applications are open here in the uh, uh, spring semester for students to apply. Um, but if it was something where for a transfer student, um, if it would help you again, increase your time to degree and being able to um, start in the summer versus the fall semester, um, contact me, you have my contact information, and let's see what we could do to maybe help you out with being able to um, give you a scholarship. Um, uh, caveat, like can't give it to every single person, but um, you know, give me a contact. Let's see what we can do because we're always trying to help students uh, save some money and get their time to degree um, increased a little bit faster. So, Great, great question. And then last question we have for you tonight, Sean. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about students uh, decreasing that time to degree and saving money, but there's maybe another angle here that students consider um, when they're thinking about summer courses is really just to possibly make their fall or their spring a little less stressful. Do you see students taking that angle and, um, you know, if they're interested in that conversation, more so just taking the stress off, making it a little less stressful, who would you recommend that they talk to? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, their academic advisor is always going to be the great person to have that conversation with. Um, and a lot of times, uh, if at Purdue's for me at some of the uh, uh, events that we have in the spring semester, that's one of the things I like to talk about with students is doing summer classes and being able to lighten that future load. So um, I'm a big believer of like all courses, uh, all majors have hard courses here. Um, and being able to spread that out a little bit is going to definitely help and to lighten your load. So instead of in a semester, uh, based off your academic plan, instead of taking 17 credit hours, why not take a summer class, um, get ahead a little bit, and then lighten your load in a future semester and only have to do 14 credit hours uh, or 15 credit hours um, just to help save it a little bit because, um, again, every little bit helps. And uh, trust me, your future self will thank your present day self by being able to do something like that. Uh, but definitely talk to your academic advisor. They're going to be a great help for you. And then again, any of those new incoming students, um, after you complete your virtual STAR modules, um, you'll work with your academic advisor. And again, tell them that you're thinking about summer classes, because again, I think it's a great option for you to speed that time to degree. And again, as this question asks, really help to lighten that future load out um, for you and kind of take some of the pressure off. 
Thank you so much, Sean. Um, there's definitely a lot of ways to put the pieces of this degree journey and puzzle together. So thank you for your insight there. I think that was a lot of great information that helps answer questions uh, that families have. So thanks so much. Going to bring Mike back with some more questions about students who may be here over the summer and are thinking about um, living in university residences. So Mike, this is actually also a question about transfer students for you. Um, can transfer students live in university residences for summer classes? Yeah, can transfer students live in university residences in the summer? Absolutely, yes. Uh, really, the only uh, only requirement is you have to you have to be a Purdue student in, enrolled in in classes. It doesn't what type of student you are uh, is not an issue in the summertime. Uh, so if you're coming in, say you want to come in for uh, a couple of summer sessions early, uh, you don't have to have a fall academic contract with us. If you're a transfer student and you're going to live off campus in an apartment in the fall, you can still live on campus in our summer school housing uh, during the summer. Uh, and likewise, if you're a current student, um, this semester living off campus, you can, you can come live on campus in the summertime. So we're, we're pretty, pretty wide open as to who can come live, uh, but definitely transfer students are, are welcome to apply to live on campus in the summer. That's great. Thanks for sharing that students have that flexibility. Um, and that's a great segue into the next question, actually, uh, which is kind of the flip side of that. Um, if a student is interested in taking summer courses and planning on taking summer courses, do they have to live in university residences or could they be living at home or in a uh, campus apartment off campus somewhere, or do they need to live in university residences? Yeah, absolutely not. You know, we don't, we don't require any of our current students uh, to live on campus other than, you know, some of, some of the specialty programs that I think uh, Sean mentioned, the uh, Summer Start, which is a first year student program, and, uh, and some of the summer high school programs, you know, they have some, some requirements to live on campus. But, uh, but in general, it is an option that's available uh, because there's uh, students that want to live on campus, they want to have the flexibility of the location, they want to have the uh, flexibility of having uh, a dining court uh, to, to take their meals. Uh, and so that's, that's some of the, some of the uh, high points of, of living on campus, but you're not required to. In fact, I, I don't know the numbers, but I would be guessing more students live off campus in the summer. Uh, let's face it, there's lots of summer subleases available out there. But, uh, but there's, there's, a, there's definitely a population that wants to live on campus and we have the space for them. Great, thank you for commenting kind of on both those different angles. Uh, and the next question is actually about um, students who might be here over the summer, but not in classes. So maybe they're here for an internship uh, in the local area over the summer and they need somewhere to stay. Would university residences be an option for students who might be doing something like that? Yes, absolutely. Summer internship housing is something we've had for several years now. Now, during COVID times, it was kind of restricted to students who were interning here on campus. Um, and uh, that restriction is lifted for this coming summer. And so if, uh, if a student is having an internship on campus, or somewhere in the community, uh, say, you know, Caterpillar is a big manufacturer that has a lot of inter interns uh, here in the Lafayette area, uh, Subaru. And, and, and so we have intern housing available. Intern housing is different from summer school housing. And, uh, and, and essentially it's, uh, it's a week by week program, uh, runs for the whole summer, May 22nd to August 7th and uh, $200 a week uh, for a single room in Hawkins Hall, different hall from, in fact, on the far side of campus from where, uh, where summer school housing is. Uh, and so, so it's really a little, little different twist. It's a, it's a single room. Uh, there's no meal plan involved because, of course, if you're interning, you're, you're probably not likely going to be hanging around in the dining courts uh, so much because you're off campus on your internship or or working somewhere around campus. So intern 
housing if you're interested in that. And we typically have 100 or more students that, that take advantage of intern housing each summer. I, I would encourage you to go to our, our housing website, housing.purdue.edu, and, and look for the intern housing link. And, and that, uh, that contracting portal for intern housing just opened yesterday at noon. Uh, so uh, so it's, it'll be open now through the summer, uh, at least uh, for those who are here on an internship. We do ask you to, to give us evidence that you're in an internship. So uh, it's not, you know, not just open for, you know, you has got a summer job somewhere. Uh, it's got to be an internship and you have to document that. But then, and check it out on the website for, for additional details about it and some of the uh, restrictions, amenities, and application processes. Thanks for sharing about that. That's a really neat option. And I imagine that students who uh, have the opportunity to take advantage of that build a really nice community of, of students who are having a similar experience too. So that's a, a great option. Um, and I have one last question for you. And I know that this is a really popular question um, among families and a question that your team uh, gets often as well. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about if students who are participating in summer sessions and living in university residences can choose their own roommate for summer? Yeah, 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 Kelly, that's that's probably the most popular question we get here in the office about summer. Uh, and 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 the the simple answer is we will try our best to get you uh, assigned together with your chosen roommate. Uh, we can't always do it because, as, as you know, you saw on previous slide, there's a lot of overlapping uh, summer sessions, and not everybody's here always at the same time. Uh, but but if we can, uh, we will try to get you together. And and uh, I think I also mentioned we do most of the summer assignments very manual process. So if our staff knows that you and uh, your friend are going to be here at the same time. Uh, they will do their best to get you assigned together. Thanks, Mike. I imagine that's also a huge puzzle to put together. Um, and do you know that your team does their very best to get folks together who want to be. Well, thank you so much. Those wrapped up our questions from our families who submitted um, prior to tonight's event for uh, summer session and university residences questions. We do hope that the information that was provided tonight is helpful to start you thinking about summer. Uh, if you're already thinking about it, give you more information and have some good points of conversation with your students about the opportunities that are available here on campus over summer. Uh, throughout the virtual event tonight, I know that Sean and Mike both shared contact information for each of their offices. This will be available for playback as soon as the session is over. So feel free to uh, head back to their slides for their contact information. I will also put up the parent and family connections contact information here. Um, if you do have more questions that weren't covered tonight or need help um, reaching out or you know pinpointing the right contact for questions related to thinking summer and summer sessions here at Purdue, please feel free to reach out to Parent and Family Connections. And as always, if you have any other questions or uh, conversations you'd like to have, we are here for that as well. Thank you so much for connecting with us. We can't wait for summer here at Purdue, and uh, we appreciate all of your involvement in your students' Purdue experience. Thanks so much for joining us.